Okay, so, so did you want to start or do I just get going? Right yeah, you way? can just you can just start. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Jane Rennick. Um, I'm a teacher at Henry Wisewood High School, um, but I'm also an amateur photographer and I've been shooting photos for the better part of two decades. I learned on film in a dark room um, and then I've just evolved kind of ever since then. So I'm really thankful to Bill for inviting me um, just to nerd out and talk about photo and composition. Um, super stoked. Okay, so what I've done is I've modified how I would teach as an intro class. Um, I've modified that for you guys. Um, so just give me a sec here. I'm gonna present my screen. Okay, what does that look like to you guys? Can you see my composition? Like yeah. the photography composition thing? Yeah, okay. we can see this place. Oh. Yeah. Okay. What I'm actually going to do, if I do this, can you guys still see it? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to double my screen there so I can kind of still see you guys. All right. There we go. Okay, so um, composition is really interesting um, to me. I'm a fan of kind of articulating it in such a way that there are rules for photography. Um, but that being said, it's really important to know that uh, rules are meant to be broken as well. So um, as much as I'm talking to you guys about rules, I think they're really important to understand how they're used. And then once you really get into photography a little bit more, you're going to break them all the time, but intentionally. Um, so there's tons of genres that you'll kind of get into as you go. Um, just the big ones here, landscape, portrait, candid, and posing in the end. Um, we have a studio here at Wisewood that I shoot in, and then abstract, which throws all these rules out of the water. And then traditional events, you might go in and get asked to shoot um, a bathing shower, or if it's big, a wedding. I've shot a couple of those before, um, where rules tend to kind of be more in place. Um, so yeah, the point being is all these different genres use the rules um, a little bit differently. Okay, so these ones are just kind of a clump of about a dozen, just over a dozen that I think are absolutely key to understanding. Um, so I'm gonna give you some examples from some photographers that I really admire, and then I'll show you a couple of shots that I've taken and how I use them. Um, Cause Bill, I'm assuming that we have like 20 minutes, 25 minutes? Yeah, around yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to whip through these really quickly. Um, and then you guys can have the presentation um, afterwards if you want to go through them a little bit more in detail. So rule of thirds is the biggest one. Um, this is ultimately um, breaking it up into a tic-tac-toe box. And then you have your subject that lies on one of these intersecting points. Um, this is easily photography one-on-one. -on -one. This would be the first rule that you ever learn. This is a photographer Annie Leibovitz who photographs celebrities. Um, when you're photographing people in rule of thirds, you also want to keep in mind their direction, their gaze. Um, not to say that you can't um, photograph them looking kind of towards the smaller side of the screen here. Um, but you do want to keep in mind they should be looking towards the more expansive side. Her on there. Um, then we go into symmetrical balance. Uh, this is Paul Micken, he's a Canadian photographer. Um, so symmetrical balance is just keeping it balanced on either side of the frame. This is Mick Rogers, this is a famous album cover. This can also be described as radial balance. Um, so what you're really looking for is perfect symmetry here. Um, equal, like had equal information on either side of the picture. Um, this is a great one horizontally. This is by a photographer, Stephen Petruski, who's actually a, Canadian, or a Calgarian. Um, he's an engineer, and then he goes off and gets sponsored by adventure companies to go to so This is our backyard, actually. And then asymmetrical, I think, is really important to understand because this is where you kind of play with balance um, in a more, like, you just kind of have to feel the balance here. So. Um, this is a well-composed shot by Taylor Reese, where typically when you're thinking asymmetrical balance, you want to think of two subjects, one, two, so like A and B, and they're balancing each other out. So now we're starting to get into controlling where the eye goes, 
so it goes to one and then it goes to two. So photography is a lot, composition is a lot about controlling the viewer's eye. Where do you want them to look first? Then where do you want them to look second? This is a great shot by an Instagram profile I adore. It's called Street Photographers International. Um, just a bunch of amateur photographers. Okay, fill the frame, really straightforward. So you have to think of your composition as a frame. How are you gonna use this real estate? Are you gonna fill it up? Um, or are you gonna use it minimally? Same thing, like you're thinking of space below the subject, space above the subject. Um, orientation, um, sometimes this one kind of goes overlooked and you don't think about it. Um, but now, especially with phones, we're using upright and horizontal um, landscape orientation very differently. But just some examples here of how you can shoot. Let me just jump into this one here. Um, so Joel Sartore plays with orientation quite a bit, where it's not always obvious. So his landscape orientation, he will intentionally use space. Um, that's one of the elements of design that we teach at school. Um, so just because your portrait orientation seems like the right choice doesn't mean you have to fill the frame. So you can decide that you want to use a different orientation kind of counterintuitively. Okay, again, like moving that eye around your composition, um, the concept of leading lines is running the eye from one spot to the next. So you have a subject that's the end goal, and then the leading line naturally in the composition um, to demonstrate that goal. Same thing here. These are amateur photographers. Um, sorry, just have an alarm that's about to go off here. There we go. Um, these are amateur photographers that submit their shots to Nat Geo and then they get selected for the magazine. Leading lines again, we have a surfer here. So start to look for lines that are naturally occurring in your shot that lead you to a subject. Okay, this is my favorite by far, angles and levels. This is gonna be the number one thing that I think you walk away from trying um, and keeping in mind the most. So most obvious is eye level. So this is Stephen Curry's work, um, one of my favorite portrait photographers by far. Um, eye level, I mean, it sounds straightforward. It's putting yourself at the eye of your subject, um, but it's not just human. So it's really getting down to the perspective of whatever you're shooting or potentially um, straight in front of them. So this is Paul Nixon, and again, he's one of our Canadian photographers. And it doesn't have to just be with animals, um, automotive industry, anything. Subjects can be objects. So it's just about picturing you um, sitting at eye level with that subject. Okay, then obviously we get into below eye level. Um, this is Daniel De Silva. She's, uh, she created the Photographer Without Borders. You can see all of that. Um, it just really creates a sort of sense of power in your subject. Um, so if you're shooting, especially like kids, I love to shoot kids from below their eye level, and it just makes them feel so much bigger with life. Um, above eye level, um, this is a, one of my favorite photographers, Jimmy Chan. These are just two portraits of him. Um, but I just wanted to use these photos as an example because it can be subtle. You don't have to consider putting yourself too much higher. So if you're shooting a portrait of your friend or something, have them sit down and stay standing above them and shoot down. Yeah. It can create some really interesting impact. Obviously, bird's eye. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. It's the back of a Rhodesian Ridgeback dog. Um, this would also con constitute abstract photography a little bit, where you're kind of removing that recognition of a subject. Um, but bird's eye can be a really powerful tool um, when you're working with abstract photography, especially. And then frog's eye is absolutely one of my favorites. You are getting on the ground. So you are putting your camera on the ground, um, your phone, whatever, and you are shooting from as low as you can looking up to that subject. And I'll show you a couple of examples later. And then this one is just for fun. This is Tim Flack, and he really likes to photograph dogs, horses, all kinds of animals, but he does so on a glass and photographs them underneath. I think it's a really interesting perspective. 
So that's angles um, and levels. The key there is just move around, change your angle, and that's going to change your whole photography game for sure. Um, dynamic tension is another really important one. What it's talking about is horizon line. Um, so there's always a horizon line that exists in your photos, um, whether you know it or not, uh, even if you're shooting indoors. The second you tilt your camera, you're going to create a really interesting effect. And don't be afraid to play with it, even in editing as well. It can create a really interesting dynamic shot. And then minimalism is another concept. Um, it's really about eliminating the fluff, eliminating all of the extra stuff that you don't need in the shot, really zeroing in on that subject. What is your goal for this picture? Getting rid of everything you don't need. Okay, scale is an interesting one. Um, I just used two photos here of a similar subject. It's really how big you want your subject in your shot. Um, and it's going to result in very different um, end goals. Obviously, fill the frame versus a more minimalist approach. Um, cropping, a lot of times this does happen in post-production and editing, um, but oftentimes you can kind of take care of this in the actual shooting. Uh, this is Jill Greenberg, love her animal work. She humanizes animals. Side note, she actually edits sometimes human eyes into her animal photography um, to try to give more, connected, uh, more connection to our audience. Um, but this is what I mean by cropping. What are you intentionally leaving out? This is such a creative composition to me. Like, why crop it out? Why not? It's just a more engaging and kind of more interesting approach to it. Again, this is Tim, Tim Flack from his work called Equius, um, where he abstracts horses a little bit by cropping. So what are you leaving out of your shop? Love it with portrait work. It really brings an intimacy to the work. This is James Notway, he's a war photographer that I, I absolutely worship. I think his work is insane, and I think this photo is just super tough with regards to the cropping. Okay, framing. Now you're just looking for frames within frames. Like, how can you zero in that subject, um, the audience's eye on the subject even more? It's a really fun one to kind of do around your house. And then pattern and then break the pattern. Um, so this is an example of pattern. Um, look around, you'll find pattern absolutely everywhere. Um, but then you can use it for your advantage as a photographer. So find a pattern and place your subject there in a small scale and it can create a really impactful composition. Okay, so we don't really have time for too much of a discussion here. So what I'd rather do is kind of skip through these guys. Um, these are some uh, work by some famous photographers and you can kind of um, go through that. And then I did include a student example um, for you guys if you wanted to go through the public and after, but I'm not gonna go through this part here. Um, but essentially what this student did was took a bunch of the composition techniques and he shot them for himself. It's symmetrical balance using the same subject, which is a really interesting approach. Portrait orientation versus landscape orientation, clever. Leading lines, again, those lines leading up to a subject. Different than eye level. Dynamic tension, so the horizon line has been tilted. Minimalism, love this shot, actually. <laughs> Just eliminates everything in the background. Contrast is one that's dropping. I love this shot. It kind of creates a little bit of intrigue. Framing, there's a natural frame happening here. And then pattern, break the pattern. Okay, so I know I kind of whizzed through those really quickly, um, but you don't really need me to sit on those and talk about them for too long. They're pretty straightforward and self-explanatory um, and it's really just about you guys kind of getting out and, and trying them but these are my daily favorite tips my daily reminders to myself when I'm shooting um, these are kind of the four things that I always kind of whether consciously or subconsciously keep in mind when I'm shooting um, number one is talking about light 
no matter how you set up something in a frame, it is going to be enhanced or made more boring by whatever light is happening around you. Um, so always consider where your light source is. Um, you can work with any type of light throughout the day. Um, but I strongly encourage you, if you're going to shoot outside, shoot in golden hour, which means shoot when the sun is just coming up or when the sun is just going down. Um, so if your mom or somebody wants to, you to take a picture of them, take them outside even into the backyard during golden hour and really play with that light because it is stunning and will take any composition and just make it that much better. Um, the next thing is horizon line placement, whether it's the top or bottom of your frame or crooked, whatever, that's another one that can really affect your shot. Um, foreground to background, what you're placing in the foreground, middle ground, background, and then at the end of the day, variety. Don't just same, shoot the same angles. So here's what I mean. I went for, um, I just kind of went through some of the shots that I've taken in the last couple weeks. Um, so this is just my dog Freya. Um, so getting down, so this would be considered eye level to Freya, but arguably frog's eye, right? You're right on the ground. I'm shooting, and all these shots have been shot with an iPhone, by the way, um, just to kind of make a point that you can be doing all of this just with a phone. Um, the newer iPhones have portrait mode, and if you switch into portrait mode, what it's going to do is it's going to blur out the light source behind you. So don't, if somebody's ever told you don't shoot into the sun, that's wrong. You can absolutely shoot into the sun. You just kind of have to work with the, with the sun. Um, if I wasn't in portrait mode, this would be a real hot spot and it would kind of take away from the photo. So you're kind of using your phone to blur it. Also, this is a great example of rule of thirds. Excuse me, puppy. Okay, so this was done yesterday. Um, we got up pretty early um, to do this hike. So this is probably about nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and the sun is just off frame. So I stay here, I keep the light just outside of the frame because I'm gonna get this gorgeous haze that I can play with, um, maybe in editing or maybe not. And I'm starting to get a few lens flares. So you're gonna start to see that when you're playing with light. Um, this is a great example of higher than eye level. So I hike up um, and I wait for people to come to me so I can take their photos as we're coming up. Um, another way to really play with light um, is silhouettes. So iPhones are incredible now, and in post-production, there's a little slider on whatever you're using, whether it's Instagram or Lightroom or anything. There's a slider um, specifically for shadows and blacks. If you bring that up just a little bit, you're going to reveal all this information in your silhouettes. So um, what I say here is lower light and shoot in the shadow. So with early light and with late light, um, so early morning and late later on in the day, you start to get really long shadows. As the photographer, place yourself in those shadows, make sure your camera is in the shadow. Um, so the sun was either, I think, right behind her head or her head, I can't quite remember. Um, so you're eliminating all lens flares, you're getting a gorgeous silhouette. We're getting a really good, what's called a rim light here on her. Um, and it just creates really interesting impact. If this shot was taken sort of midday with no shadows, we would not be getting the same impact. And then obviously this is a lower than eye level. All your shadow shots will be. Okay, but it's gonna happen where you're out shooting and it's maybe like either midday and it's the most boring light, like there's literally no shadows happening here. This is during the fires. So this was actually later on at night or in the afternoon and you're hoping to get a sunset, but we didn't. So we had a really boring sky, no clouds, no beautiful light to work with. So it's gonna happen. What do you do? You use minimalism, that's my favorite. Um, I really think there's a high impact with this shot. Um, this is just a funny one because my friend absolutely was terrified of crows and one landed on the hill during this shot and freaked her right out and she kept her composure because I told her I was taking a picture. Um, but yeah, so take advantage of the fact that it is an empty sky. Do this with a blue bird, beautiful blue sky that has no clouds and use it for minimalism. Place your subject really, really low. Place your horizon line really low and use that big sky just to fill your composition. Um, minimalism can be a really beautiful thing and really fun to edit actually. 
And then this is actually what I mean um, by foreground element. So this is actually a frog eye photo. Um, I hiked up and I put my phone, I'm sitting with my phone on the ground and I put my phone right in this little patch of lonely grass. You can see that they kind of popped up all the way up the trail. Um, iPhones are amazing now. The, their or their um, ability to change aperture and which will come later when you learn more about photography, but aperture is just gonna affect blurring. So this will naturally blur. Um, so this just gives awesome dimension to your photos. Find something that you can shoot through or place in the foreground. Um, if I'm ever asked to photograph a portrait of someone outdoors, um, I'll oftentimes rip grass off or like rip um, like wheat out of a field or something and I will literally hold it in front of my lens to create something in the foreground and then shoot a portrait and then have the background behind them. Um, again, that light is just my intention to put it right outside of my frame. So I love this like haze that you get because it creates a sort of dimension in light. And then last, I think this is welcome at me. Yeah, um, horizon line. Um, so don't be afraid to tilt it. So this horizon line is going a little wonky. Same thing with this one. Um, this is this, uh, my friend took a picture of me on the dock, but um, the crooked horizon line sometimes works. So don't always think that it has to be straight. Sometimes shoot it a little off and then shoot it straight and decide which one you want. Um, this just works because of the content, especially um, hiking on a mountain is a little bit tilty. And this works too, being on a dock um, with water kind of works where it's not perfectly, perfectly stable. And again, this one was shot frog eyes well. You can see there's rock here that I placed my phone on to try to get a different angle. Okay, so I think that brings me to the end of my time. Sorry, I spoke really, really quickly. Um, there's a lot in 20 minutes. Um, gosh, we could do like six sessions on composition alone. Um, but I think I just skimmed the surface of things that if I were just starting, um, those would be the ones that I would really want to know and really want to play with. So, homework, um, should you choose to. Scroll through photos um, now in photo stories and consider how the photographer used composition. So really take into account now with these rules, like what do you think they were thinking of? 95% of it happens while the photo is being taken and only about 5% of it can happen in post-production, being like cropping maybe and horizon line, um, playing with minimalism. So really it's all well thought out to begin with. Um, the next one I think is the most important one, just variety. Just take a ton of different shots different angles so what i would do is plan on taking like ask a friend to go for a walk with you and plan on taking at least 10 photos and no two angles can be the same um, so get low get high um, and just change it up and then that's going to be i really do think that's going to be the biggest game changer for anyone's photography and some of them are going to be terrible but that's okay that's how we learn um, choose one subject to photograph it five times and in each photo the subject must be a different size in the shot. So that's talking about scale. Um, sometimes it'll be really good when it's huge and filling the frame and sometimes there's a real impact having it minimal and small in the frame. And then I would also play with that rule of thirds grid. So choose one subject and photograph it four times each time placing it on a different point in the rule of thirds grid. Because what you'll start to feel is that you'll start to feel like, oh, it did not work there. Like, that's not good. I can't have it on that part of the grid. Move it down. Um, and that'll be your biggest teacher. You'll start to feel like you actually know more than you think in photography. Um, you are just need to kind of formalize it a little bit. So yeah, that's all I've got. I think that was my, yeah, my last slide. There we go. So I'll share that presentation with Phil. And then if you guys want to use it, you're welcome to. Yeah. yeah. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Or if they want to go back to any of the slides, you guys can do so. If not, uh, we can just end off the meeting today. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Miss Rennick. Yeah, thank you, Bill.